Ori. Welcome to Men's Locker Room. I have graduated from the School of Life. My experiences have been my education, and I'm a boy who has lived. What's a typical Khalees? Other Avatramani household like? What's a Khalees? What's a Khalees? Who would qualify as his friend in your life? We have to marry. Yeah, yes. <laughs> If I'm advertising the good times, babe, I'm advertising the bad times. You, with me, I. With you, your life looks so much fun. Is it as fun I'm as eating cheese? Which is the best place that you've really had your fun? People be like, oh, New York, Monaco, Morocco, Greece. Blah 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 blah. No, the best place was Chandigarh. Are you single? The last person who went down on me was my waxing lady. Do you also have like red flags? I, babe, who doesn't love drama? <laughs> The more the flags, the more attractive the person. Bring me the flag. Too shit. Bring me the red flags. What do you value most in a friendship? Friendship is a complicated thing. It's not a simple thing. It's not a you like my picture, I like your picture. It's beyond that. It's you have to look good in my picture. Rocky Sawant and I also have a really close bond. The Because first we're every time I actually got that was. Another John Wick Kapoor story. So back in the day when I used to bus tables at a group, our little waiters group. Hold up, hold up! I knew you were gonna ask that. We'll get back to it. Hi, Ori. Welcome to Men's Locker Room. Hi. Thank you for having me. <laughs> How are you feeling today? I'm good. I'm always good. <laughs> you know, I'm great. Good? Yeah. Your real name is Orhan. Orhan. Yeah. It sounds like a Turkish name. It is Turkish. It means leader of the Turkey. Wow. You like like Turkish people, not the buck buck. <laughs> who kept it? Your mother or your father? Um, actually, my aunt suggested it to my mom, who really liked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, so your parents are they also born and raised in Bo- Bombay? Yeah, my parents are from Bombay. I mean, I wasn't raised in Bombay, but my parents were born and raised. In Where were you raised? Uh, most people think I was born and I mean lived my whole life in Bombay. I actually grew up in the southern foothills of India. Okay. Yeah, a uh, Kodai Kanal. It's Good a small hill station. It's really cute. Aww. Like it's really random and it's really small and there's not much there. We had like one like pizza place, like a pizza shack or pizza hut or something mm-hmm. like that, and one coffee place, and that was about it. It was just sweet. We had a lake and stuff. Oh, so what was growing up there like? Growing up in Cody was very cute. Okay. Very American, very humble. Yeah. Are you still friends with people there? Oh, I'm friends with all my friends from Gori. All of them. I'm best friends with my roommate, and I'm best friends with my whole friend group. I'm in touch with all of them. I go visit all of them. I've never let go of a friend. I have all my friends. They're all in my pocket <laughs> and on my Instagram. I'm in t- I'm daily in touch. Where all have you studied? Let's get that out of the question. I've s- I've traveled. I've traveled the world in the seven seas. I've traveled. I've studied all over the place. Okay. I've studied in Bombay. I've studied in Tamil Nadu. I've studied in Connecticut. I've studied in New York. I've studied in London. I think I may have even studied in Canada. Yeah, but I consider myself as a graduate from the School of Life. So if you say where have you studied, and I'm bringing up college and high school and course here and cooking class there, I don't consider that my education. I have graduated from the School of Life. My experiences have been my education, and I'm a boy who has lived. Yeah. So I've done it all. I've been here before, and I've done it, and I've learned it. Yeah, that's me. How old are you? No, I don't answer that question. Okay. One must never reveal that. You can't ask people. It's a very rude question. I know, right? But it's okay. I was just trying my luck. I'm borderline Gen Z. Oh, borderline Gen Z. Borderline. Okay. Like a little here and <laughs> half a pen down. Okay. What's a typical Kalish at the Avatramani um, household like? What's a Kalish? Oh, okay. I'll tell you. So Kalish is basically it's a Punjabi slang. And it means a typical fight or a typical argument or an altercation. There are no fights. No. There are no arguments. Is everybody as poised as you? The biggest fight is like, oh, you entered my room without knocking on the door and waiting for me to, you know, without announcing yourself in entry. Is like probably the biggest fights I have at home. Wow. Don't enter the room without knocking. I'm naked. <laughs> That's it. That's cute. There are no other fights. And you seem like a good friend, also. You just you were talking about an open letter. Yes. So you do that for most of your friends. I've now started on everyone's birthday writing an open letter. Dear so and to my dearest friend so and so, wishing you many happy returns of the day. Hope you have a joyous and prosperous birthday anniversary. And then this longer letter after that, following up with quotes from the Bible and tips of life. And then like you know, 
principal or tuition teacher gives a report card, I give a friendship report card. You have been the most diligent girl I've ever known. You've been the most generous person. You're so giving and loving. And sometimes you allow people to take advantage. I write an open air sticker on my Instagram. <laughs> So in case I write the note card that they don't read, I've also uploaded it for them to read. It's always there. So, yeah. Okay, so in this friendship metric, like what's your friendship metric? For example, who would qualify as a friend in your life or as a BFF in your life or as a 3 a.m. friend yeah, in your life? Friends. Yeah, you have <laughs> No, I'm kidding. But that's what I read on the internet. <laughs> um, it's not that hard. I am a very social person. I'm also not a social person, but I am... A social. I am open to friends. Like if you come up to me and very confidently start talking to me, I believe confidence should always be rewarded. So I will make that friendship. And I am the kind of person who spends my day commenting on people's pictures and replying to stories. And so now if you've met and I thought you were cool and you thought I was and we vibed and we have each other on Instagram, you don't even have to make the effort. I've made it. So it's not that hard, but you cross me once and you're out. Like I said, I'll block you. You won't even get the chance. So... You lied to me, I don't take lies very well because, you know, I don't like breaking rules and I don't like lying and these mis incorrect things I'm not okay with. Or, um, or you leave me behind at a party, yeah, you're out. Yeah, is that really a thing? That's, oh, that's a thing. I was just left behind at a party last weekend yeah. for my best friend, okay? And we were at a rooftop pool party and she just left without saying, and I was like, don't ever think that we are so close that you can leave without saying bye or you're so cool and famous and popular because because I felt like I was the more famous popular one in the friendship and I'm still here <laughs> and she left me with her private Instagram this is like a very close friend I'm not dissing some celebrity she's gone and then I kept calling her saying babe where are you where are you like I can't find you I'm lost and I'm blind my number is minus 8.5 so I'm a few drinks and I'm blind and she's like oh I'm coming back I'm coming back so I was like oh great waiting waiting I had another drink and another drink I was just left alone at this party and I was like she never came. I was like, that's attempted murder. I could have fallen in the pool and drowned. I could have fallen off the terrace and died. I don't know how I made it home, but I did in one piece. But that was attempted murder. I've not spoken to her since. Oh. And what do you value most in a friendship? Apart from all of um, course, this. There's a lot one values in a friendship. A friendship is a complicated thing. It's not a simple thing. It's not a, you like my picture, I like your picture. It's beyond that. It's you have to look good in my picture as well. So I look good in my picture because you look good with me and you have to edit me the way I like me and I have to edit you. You have to have my back and I have to have your back. When you call me at whatever hour because something's happened, I pick up the phone and I'm not hanging up because I have something better to do. And when you need me and you're howling after a breakup, I'm with you. And when I'm committing suicide because something's gone wrong, you're with me. You know, I had a best friend, I mean, still have this best friend who literally after a heartbreak has taken me like, all over Greece, boat to here or to there, and I've drank booze for morning, breakfast, lunch, night, dinner, cried all over Greece, and she's just held my hand. She doesn't even drink. Sober through all of that. And I probably ruined her Greece holiday, you know, <laughs> but, but she did it, and it was fun, and we look back at it, and it was really fun. But you have to stick with me through the tough times, and I'm going to stick with you through the good times. And the road is long. We carry on and try to have fun and burn in time. Aww. And what kind of a friend are you? Like, are you the one that people call for advice? Are you the one that people call for making social plans? The most funniest thing that you even asked. The other day, my other very good best friend called me howling about something and howling and howling. And um, I was like, babe, listen, this is what I would do. And all you got to do is, she's like, all right, all right, let me stop you right there. I didn't call you for advice. I called you to vent. Because what you would do and what I would do will never be on the same page. It's like, you are the most weirdest out there, like your pro way of solving the problems, so just bounce and go here and bounce and go there or do this and do this. I'll never do that. So I would never do that. You're the most unrelatable person. There's nothing you would do that I would do. I just want you to sit and hear me scream and shout about what's going wrong at home and with my family and with my day and with my work. Do not give me advice. And I was like, I, I felt really bad. She's like, if I want something to do with a picture or with an outfit or something, close, whatever, frivolous related, I'm calling you. You're the one. But right now, just make me laugh because you do that and cheer me up because you do that and hear me vent because you have ears. But do not bother telling me what to do because it ain't, we not. And I, that's when I realized, like, shit, like, I didn't realize I was so out of touch with the reality or relatability of things. Because, like, even this phone case, like, she was like, I'm not, don't even, I don't know. She was like, you're just unrelated. And I was like, I felt really bad. Oh, attacked. 
attacked. Yes, wow. it was an ambush. <laughs> it was her calling to vent, but it was me under, like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, I'm listening. And I cracked some funny jokes and I said some funny things. But all in all, I was the victim of that conversation now when I look back at it. Yeah. I think another another person's going to get blocked very soon. Yes. You know? Yeah. Are you the funny one in the group? I don't know. I wear many hats. Hmm. And I feel like I can be the sensitive one. I can be the funny one. I can be the irritating one. Most of the time, if you ask people, they probably say I'm the irritating one. Never the needy or insecure one. That's not me. That's off brand. But um, the cool one. The fun one. Yeah. The posh one. The posh one. Well, I must say, your life looks so much fun. Is it as fun I'm as it looks? Genius. Yes? Yes. You know what? I can, I can say that. After having spent like a day with you, of course, not in that close proximity, but I must say you are a marketing genius. Okay, so you recently went to Greece. And I think you recently went to I, Monaco also. I did. I How did go to Monaco. And it's so funny that you asked because I was actually only in Monaco for two hours. Only my journey hours? visiting Monaco was longer than my journey in Monaco. So Dude, I then. had landed for a friend's party in San Nice. I landed in Nice, went to Saint Tropez, after that found some other friends and took a boat with them from Saint Tropez, hopping through the south of France, ended up in Monaco. My flight was at 10 p.m. No, 10.30 p.m. So I reached the airport in time for my 10.30 flight. And when I reached there, we find out the flight was at 10 p.m. So I missed the flight. But there was a BA flight or another flight that I could book in an hour. I was taking off in like an hour or something. So I was like, let me just book this flight because I'm driven from Monaco. Nice again and I have to get back to London. And it was the other terminal. So I was like, great. And here is where the story goes wild. Okay. I booked this other flight. I have no roaming, my roaming, I don't know, I had three phones, no roaming, no calls, no texts. I'm like hysterically calling my brother on WhatsApp at someone's hotspot to call my father because that's where the email has been sent. The ticket email has gone. My father's waking up in India. My mom's going crazy because I don't call them in the middle of the night from Monaco and yeah. just like that. So they're panicking, not knowing that I'm emailing them tickets because they think I'm supposed to be on a flight. Now, the terminal that this flight was, was another terminal. And you're supposed to go by something like a tram. That's apparently a train, but also a bus. But God knows what it was because it wasn't there. And so I'm like running and sweating and holding my bags. And luckily, I had only a carry-on suitcase. So one hand, the carry-on's flying. The other hand, the handbag's flying. My passport's in my mouth. and running. No Uber, no car, no bus. Just me and my two little feet. And they're very small, but I'm running. And then finally, I've like hitchhiked my way to T2, which is a good 30 minutes away. T1 and T2 are not the same. Reach the airport. Gates closed, security is closed. The people who are supposed to help you aren't there because you know in these foreign countries they have these self-check-in devices that never work. I'm like howling and crying and I'm sweating through all my clothes and finally someone gave me a boarding pass and I reached the flight which was obviously delayed. So now I'm in a line to get on the flight. Get on the flight. Flight's delayed by two and a half hours. I'm sitting on the plane between two fatties. <laughs> That's fine. No, it wasn't fine. I'm squashed. Two hour bloody delay. Land in London. 30 minute delay to get off the plane. Plane to the bus, 30 minutes from the bloody plane to the airport. And then you have to go up this back shady staircase into the airport. Now, finally, I've reached my driver. I love my chauffeur. He's the nicest person in the world. He does everything for me. He's got me my McDonald's after this sweaty, hectic, squashed between these, like, you know, smelly people journey. I'm in the car. Got my McDonald's, got on the highway, one and a half hours to central London. And on the highway, we are stopped. Everyone is stopped. Because okay. so some man has just decided to jump off a moving train, off a bridge, onto the highway and go, ooh, ooh. Oh, in a murder-suicide case. So as interesting as the murder-suicide case was to hear about the highway at bloody three in the morning, flying back from Monaco, I didn't even bathe after, like, you know, jumping in the water and whatever. Um, four hours on the highway. And then finally I reach home and some man has vomited outside my building on the staircase. That's all I remember about Monaco. It wasn't the two hours that it, to maybe three hours I spent in Monaco. You so spent more time coming back. More time on the highway, <laughs> this murder, suicide case. I didn't even, I got nothing. I got a good Instagram picture and I had a good party in San Tropez the night before and that was it. Hmm. But you've traveled all around the world. I've traveled. I've right. And you've partied everywhere. Which I won't say I've partied everywhere. I've traveled everywhere and I've partied in a few places. Yeah. yeah. Which is the best place that you've really had your fun? Now, you're going to think, and this was the best trip that I've ever been on, if you're asking me my best trip. 
um, people will be like, oh, New York, Monaco, Morocco, Greece, blah, 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 blah. No. The best place was Chandigarh. Yeah? Yes. So back in the day when I used to bus tables at a group, our little waiters group, okay? And hold up, hold up. I knew you were going to ask that. We'll get back to it. Okay. A little waiter group. And I had a best friend who was getting married. And you know, she was a typical cute Punjabi girl from Chandigarh who got married and moved to Canada. And so our little group were like, let's go. I mean, we're all going for our best friend's wedding. And we're not going to miss it. And so we all took a little flight from Bombay to Amritsar. That's where the Vaga border is, right? Yeah. And somehow back at that time when I was so young, I don't know how, but one of us hooked up the VIP tickets for the Vaga borders. We all gone overdressed, watched the Vaga border, then got in into our car that we had like, you know, reserved or whatever. That shouldn't be doing that. Um, to go to the Golden Temple, because mm-hmm. where Amritsar, you have to go to the gold. So we Absolutely. all changed in the car mm-hmm. with the driver who didn't take it too well, because after the Golden Temple, when we went to find the car, he had left us. Managed. And we had the wedding the next day. And we are all dressed like we had gone to a wedding to the Golden Temple to get a cute pic, you know, like whatever I'd like to pray. And whatever, you know. Um, and now we didn't have a way to get to Ludhiana, which is where the wedding was. And so we have hitchhiked, trying to go from one place to the other place. And somehow ended up in like, I wouldn't call it a van or a truck, but have you seen Kuch Kuch Hota in that scene that... Uh, he sits on sort of throughout the Jaraja, I mean, they're bound. And they're down the or the van. Something like yeah. that. But they didn't understand what we were saying. So they didn't take us to Ludhiana. They dumped us in Jolando, <laughs> if you know where that is. And we spent the night eating dinner, the best dinner of my life. Here. At a Naba? No, at a Haveli called Haveli. Oh. Wow. I was scared for my life. Like you can be at a nightclub and you can party and you can have drinks. You can be at a fashion show in Paris or you can be like living it up in New York or like, you know, like doing something else. But I was never scared for my life. I was scared for my life on that van being dumped in the middle of Jolando, but finding that heavenly Haveli where we have the bowed food. And I don't even remember how we got to Ludhiana the next day for this wedding. Yeah. Wow. You've what had it? an eventful life. And trips. I am a boy who has lived. Yeah. Clearly. I'm a liver. Yeah. It makes sense. Actually, there was a Harry Potter kept here. Oh, there is. And it just reminded me the boy who lived. Oh, yes. Yes. Boy, oh, yes. Ori Potter. Yeah. Boy who lived. Ori Potter. What are the on jobs have you taken up? I've like worked at business conferences. When I was 19, mm-hmm. literally, that was, that, was ni- that was 19 for me. Wow. Where else? What? What are other on jobs have you done? I'm asking. I've done it all. Yeah. I've done it all. Yeah. I'm done. I've been a god now. I've, been, I've worked at Vogue India. That's something I've done in Bombay. I've been a graphic designer. I'm a man of many hats. <laughs> For sure. I can't say I aced every job, but I did it. And what have you liked doing the most? What have I liked doing the most? I've not liked anything. I've loved everything. Like I said, I'm a boy who has lived and I'm a man of many experiences. There's not been an experience I've had that I've not liked. Touch wood. Touch. Touch wood. Touch wood. I'm not superstitious, but touch it. <laughs> Okay, so by far, in 2023, which has been the best party that, that you've attended? It was only a matter of time till you asked me this. I do do more than go to parties, but every party has been a fun party. I had a blast. I've had a blast. No party have I attended. That, as I've not been to a party that I've not liked. I have not, yeah, I've not been to a party that every party has been the most fun party. Every day I go to a new party is the most fun party. You can dump me on the road in an alley somewhere and if it's a party I'll have fun and you can put me in a palace and I'll have fun. I, If I'm there it's a party, I'm the party, I can party alone in my bedroom and I'll have a great day. Just give me some good music and two best friends and I can have a blast. Yeah. Who according to you has been the most gracious host? Host? Host. I believe Karan Johar is yeah. the most gracious host. I would not know because I've not been to his parties but I've heard a lot of talk and um, and I've heard that he's the best host who throws the best parties. Yeah. Have you ever gate crashed a party? No, no, I'm not gate crashed. I want to say who hasn't. And now that you've said that, I'm sure I have. I just can't recall a recent one. I'm 100% sure I, ha- I have. But I just. Do you know of one that I have? Um, honestly, no. 
you're actually yeah. invited everywhere. You're being hosted really well. You're being called yeah. after, and all of that I is happening. I don't know. I'm sure I have been live, but I don't think so recently. I haven't because like I'm not a rule breaker. And breaking Stick into a party you. is breaking a rule. And I'm not going to get thrown out of a party the same way I'm not getting thrown out of Nando's. What's the most craziest thing that has happened at a party? Because, you know, people for people like us who are from the outside looking in, we don't know what goes on. Our parties are... I story different. everything. So if I'm at the party, you're with me. I'm live tele- televising the party on my Snapchat live. So nothing crazy is happening. It's absolutely just... It's just... All the parties I go to are just as fun as all the parties you probably go to. Or maybe for me, I'm telling you, you can put me anywhere. You can drop me at a college fest, I'm going to have a blast. You can drop me at some random rave and I'm going to have a blast. I don't think anything that special happens. Like, I'm also having a blast at lunch. I'm also having a blast at my book club. I'm also having a blast at my Bible study. I have come here to have fun. I have not come to have a bad time. So, yeah, that's it. You're the party starter? Mm, I could be the party starter if the day requires it. If the day requires me to start a party, I could start the party. If the day requires me to just be a gracious attendee or a guest, I'm also that. You know, different days, different roles, and different levels of respect to the host. But, yeah. And many hats that you wear. And the many hats that I wear, yeah. You know, I read something really interesting on Reddit the other day about you. I love you. Reddit. Do you I check it out? I love Reddit. And not only do you, I, I have a terrible addiction where I have to like, and comment on everything. So that people comment, and I'm replying. And they're like, oh, why is he doing this? And I'm like, because of this, and I'm replying in first person. I'm not even saying, oh, he's doing this, because I'm saying it as me. I am in the comment section, I'm with you. I am with you in that comment section, commenting on my own goddamn photo. (laughs) But ask your question. Okay, so what I read was, like people were wondering that are you better friends, or are you tighter with either Nissa Devgan or the Kapoor sisters? And this is something the Reddits will never know, because they're not in my DMs. I'm very close to Nysa, of course, and I'm very close to the Kapoor sisters. But what people don't seem to realize is that I'm also like very close to many other people. Like I have lots of good friends. Like for example, Rocky Savant and I also have a really close bond. Really? We just haven't met recently because we keep making plans to meet at the airport and our flights never match. But we also share a special bond. I can tell you Rocky does not reply to many of her DMs, like even if she's someone you know. But she'll reply to me and with three voice notes. And I love her for that. How do you make friends? I don't know. Different day, different story, different friendship, different... Like is it usually friend of friends, some, somebody you socially bumped into, or have you ever made friends through Instagram, randomly? Of course. Yeah? You can bump into someone and become their friend, a total stranger. I have many of those. I have all roster of the strangers who are now friends. I have friends of friends who are friends. And I have my internet relationships that have amounted into friends. So yeah, in fact, internet relationships, they sound weird, but like, you can, you know, you can see someone on the internet and say, this is the kind of person I think I'd get along with. This is the kind of person I think I'd get along with. So you've already done like, you know, your bio data. R&D. Checking, like almost like a rishta, but a friendship rishta. So that paperwork's done. And then if you meet in the vibes, collab, a collab or whatever, or collab, you know, go well together, then great. But um, yeah, you've done your homework before meeting someone. And many of those relationships last very long, but yeah. I could make friends with this plant if you leave me alone in the room for too long. Like, it'll happen. I start talking to it, it'll talk back. You come across as such a softy, it's so nice. It's heartwarming, actually. Thank you. Because, you know, people only have, like, a linear image and they see only a few things up on the camera. Okay. <laughs> okay, never mind. So, we were talking about relationships. Uh, are you single? Are you dating? I'm so single right now that the last person who held my hand was actually the guy who cut my nails. <laughs> and... The last person who went down on me was was my waxing lady. And she was waxing my toe. So I could sit barefooted in this interview. And that's the situation, right? I've become the face of Bumble for two minutes. <laughs> so how long, uh, clearly, like, what's the longest relationship that you've been in? No, I can't answer that. Okay. That I, I don't want the other people to hear and be like, oh, that was longer. That was mm-hmm. okay, fair enough. Have you experienced heartbreak? Who hasn't? And if you haven't, please go get your heart broken and don't be a loser at hand. Uh, these two friends were like, oh, you know, our walls are always up and we don't want to have heart broken and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, ew, the heart's meant to be broken. Yeah, that sounds cringe. But if you have your walls up, you're not locking other people out. You're locking yourself in and alone. 
and time's not on your side. You're going to be old and alone and in this locked little world thing, wondering like when this boy is going to come or girl is going to come and no one's coming to look for you. Like be out there, go live your life. Heartbreak is probably the best experience. Yes, you're crying for like two months, three months, sometimes a year. But your heart had to be really full for it to be broken. And that really full feeling is what we're after. So only when it's like really full, then something happens. And boom. What kind of a partner are you in a relationship? Um, I've changed so much over the years that I'm sure I've been a different person with different people. I'm sure A would look at me with B and say, oh, he's like that, but he was never like that with me. And B will look at me with C and be like, oh, he's like that, he was never like I'm like, babe, I'm growing. Not in height, but I'm growing. I'm living, I'm changing. You can't judge someone for what they are today because they won't be that person tomorrow. And you can't judge someone for what they were yesterday because they're not that person today. So I forgot the question, but I feel like I answered. <laughs> you did. Do you also have like red flags when you meet somebody and you're suddenly like, oh my God, this person has this quality, he's out. Or she's out. Or they're she's out. out. Yeah, like I was talking from my perspective. I know, but I was just being, um, you know, today in today's climate, you have to be very uh, inclusive of the, the pronouns and yeah. the days and the thems and... Okay. Yeah, you get it. So, yeah, whatever. Um, what was the question? Okay, so I'll take the red question flags. again because you've actually given me a great tip. The red flag. The red flags, yeah. So do you also have like a list of red flags that if the person has this, then that person's out? Red flags. Babe, who doesn't love drama? <laughs> the more the flags, the more attractive the person. Bring me the flag. Do say. Bring me the red flags. <laughs> yeah. But have you had regrets? No. I personally believe, and this is an easy question to answer because I've answered it so many times, you should never regret anything in life because at one point of time, it was exactly what you wanted to do. And I do what I want. So I can't regret that moment because I did exactly what I wanted and I'm proud of him for doing it. Like, you go. You did it. You did what you wanted. And I'm not feeling bad about it. What's one of the most toxic traits that you feel you have? Everybody has some. Yes, this is the most toxic trait I have. I'm an advertiser and I will advertise everything. If I'm advertising the good times, babe, I'm advertising the bad times. You, with me, I, with you. So you're fighting with me. You will see me randomly one day put up a story saying, for all those concerned or involved or, you know, PSA, public service announcement, X, Y, and Z and I are no longer friends due to blah, blah, blah reasons and blah, 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 like this one did not show up to lunch on time and came three days later. We are no longer friends and blah, blah, blah. And I will recite and vomit all the details of this, this fight. And remember, big Ori, please, you have to keep your dirty laundry. You know, what is the line? Uh, don't air your dirty laundry. Air, I was, why? I'm airing the party. I'm airing the lunch. Like, I'm airing my looks. If I'm airing all of those times, I'm airing you. Surely I will air this time too. So don't think that I won't. But I hear it's a very toxic trait and I shouldn't be doing that. But I can't resist. Everybody has their vices. So, yeah. so I'm not airing the good times. I'm airing the times. And if the times are good, it's aired. If the times are bad, it's definitely, surely it's going to be aired. That is my toxic trait. Fair. Airing it all. <laughs> okay. And what's the one thing that you love about yourself? What a difficult question. What is the one thing oh, you love about yourself? Can it be a multiple choice question? Can you give me options? Okay, wow. Okay. Let me think of options, actually. This has yeah, gotten interesting. Down. Oh, it's okay. So, do you love your personality? I love my personality. Do you all love... All eight of them. Yeah? All eight of all them. All eight of them. Maybe nine. Who knows? Ten. I love all ten of them. We hang out. <laughs> okay, so do you love your personality more? Yeah. Do you love your fashion sense more? Mm -hmm. Do you love your, um, the fact that you're empathetic, uh, you come across as somebody who, you know, who has too many emotions and who's emotional like that? Or? Or, do you love your sass? I don't think I'm sass. You've been throwing sass around like confetti. Where? Here. <laughs> oh, have I? Yes. Is it? Yeah. I didn't know. Fifth option, do you love your modesty more? Yes. I love how humble I am. I love my level of humility. I love that I'm humble. I love that I'm down to, uh, not relatable apparently, but down to earth. Yeah, that's it. 
I love that no matter where I've come in life and people think I've come a long way, I am still that boy who was once busting tables at 19. It's cool. Doing the night shift here. This is the worst one. Fine. Pack up. Oh, you have to pack up. Actually, mornings was going to clean it. It's all equally bad. But it's okay. It's made you, you. The groundwork was laid. Yeah. And so was the table. See, that's the stash I'm talking about. Pun intended. Pun. Okay. How would you define privilege? What a controversial question. Okay. I'm going to try and explain it. And if I explain it badly, we'll re-explain it. Correctly. Privilege is the advantage that one person has and another person does not have. And without sounding inconsiderate or without sounding, not heartless, but yeah, I guess maybe just without sounding inconsiderate or up my own self, I think privilege is subjective. I think everyone has been born with their own struggles and their own silver spoon. What you may see as my privilege, I may not think I have, and I may see him with his privilege, and I may be like, shit, he's so privileged, he has so much more than I do, and he has the advantages and access that I don't have. But you may be seeing the same thing in me, but he may be seeing the same thing in you. So I just think it's subjective. Of course, that some people are born with way more, and some people are born with way less. But I believe that we're on our own path, and everyone's path has their silver spoons and their struggles. You know, I think my mom said, someone told me, like, you know, with a the horse, they like bl- cover the it goes on the side. Yeah. And I never really understood it because I'd see those horses and be like, why have they blinded the horse? Is it a pirate horse as a little boy, you know? And they were like, no, it's so the horse doesn't look left or right. Because when you're running a race or whatever you're doing, you shouldn't look left or right. So, yes, he may be more privileged than me and she may be way more privileged than me, Andy. And this one may come from way lesser means, but I'm running my race. I'm not looking at you and I'm not looking at you. Maybe if my friends are learn something, a thing or two, but I'm not looking at what you have that I don't, and I'm not looking to feel bad about it. And I hope you aren't looking at me and what I have or I don't, and I hope you're not feeling good or bad about it. Yes, that is my view on it. I don't want to not acknowledge the privileges I've had in life. I can tell you life has thrown me multiple opportunities, you know, sometimes without me asking it, and I've benefited it from it, and those opportunities a privilege in my life because he may not have it and she may not have it but it's my life and that's what came to me and I'm sure in your life something came to you it's how you deal with the cards you're dealt and yeah some cards are better than the others but it's how you know it all comes that come it all comes down to that it is what it is it is what it is like I'm not saying life is not fair life can be unfair very unfair and sometimes it can also be great but it is what that's how the cookie crumbles you can't sit if you sit here and cry about what that person has or look at what that person has that you don't have and be like, oh, they have this and they have that and I don't. You're never going to get ahead in life. You're never going to go anywhere. You have to sit, you, you have to be the driver in the driver's seat of your own life and you have to go ahead. You have to fill the oil up in your car and you have to make sure your engine's working fine and if you want to look good, cool, make sure the car looks great, wrap it, whatever. You have to be in the driver's seat of your own life and you have to go forward. Do not, yeah, that, that is my thing. Do not look left, right, yeah. No nazar on anyone, no nazar on you. Have you had fears in life? Or do you still? Of course. How do you feel? I can't see it off the top of my head, like, what, what, do I, what, am I, what do I fear? What am I scared of? I don't know. I can tell you once my biggest fear was being in a car crash. I shouldn't say that. I don't want to pull it into my universe. Thuk, thuk, thuk. Um, I can tell you sometimes my biggest fear is when I put up a photo dump on Instagram that the people who have approved the pictures and you said, yes, I look fine here and okay, my hair is fine here, will then start calling me up and say, delete the photo, delete the, that, that, is, that is a fear. It is a fear. Um, but my fears can range from A to Z and sometimes they can be really serious and sometimes they can, like recently I haven't had any like big fears, but sometimes you can like fear where your next meal is going to come from or where, where you're going to sleep tomorrow night. You may just not know. And... I've had all the fails. I've had them all. Touch with today, I'm not scared of much. The photo dump I put up today has been approved. No one's complaining. But, um, yeah. What makes you anxious? It's going to come off like a really dumb answer. There are no dumb answers. There are no dumb answers and there are no dumb questions. Typing people's name into the Instagram search bar is the biggest Inside, I will not do it. You cannot make me do it. You cannot pay me money 
or blackmail me to type a name into the Instagram search bar. Okay, but I, why? I, I will not. It makes me anxious. Give me someone. Name someone. I'll name myself Sadhika Sehgra. Now, let's say I go to, you know, type your name Sadhika on Instagram and I'll be in fear of my life that as I put S, you will go like this. And as I put A, you'll go, you'll go like that. And as I'm typing your name, you'll start hiccuping and you will know somewhere that Ori is typing my name and he's going on my profile and what does he want and why is he here? And it's my biggest, not fear, but it just makes me so anxious. So I will actually type, you know, www.instagram.com slash whatever your handle is and type it to my cell phone WhatsApp and click on the link. But I will not type in the search bar. I won't do it. No. Are there some other... My, chart, my search history is clean. Yeah? Yeah. Are there other such quirky things that you don't like doing? This is not all? quirky. This is a serious problem. Yes, but it it's honestly, it's the first time that I'm hearing of it. But I'm sure other what? people have... But now that I think about it, I think it might just be a bail. Just problem. imagine tomorrow you're going to search your ex or some celebrity or your nemesis and they know they know like in their head there's like screen playing you and Spongebob's doing something like that, and they, they can see that you are typing their name in the search and you're on their profile and, and I have a terrible habit I told you I have to press like I have to do it if I've, I don't like a picture because I've liked the picture I like it because I've seen it I mean ting or you seen ting or you seen so they're going to know that if I, you know so either I mean yeah you're, even if I click on the link now that I say it loudly they're going to know that I visited and I was there looking in the comment section. Makes sense. Now, now I think I'll give it to him. Who? I'll give it to you. Like oh, now, I get it. Yeah, the extent of it, the insight. This is a big ordeal. Like I can have had heart palpitations <laughs> doing this. I want so. How do you quell such anxiety? You don't do it. You don't search the name. I'm not. But sometimes the feeling still creeps up, right? I read somewhere that you cannot feel anxious and gratitude at the same time. So my anxiety ever starts creeping in for any reason other than this event. You have to start listing the things in life that you're grateful for, be it as simple as a roof over your head or as simple as a pair of shoes that you can wear and you're not walking around bare feet with your feet tearing on the ground. Um, and when you start listing the things you're grateful for, your anxiety apparently goes down. It's worked for me. Maybe it's a trick. Maybe it's the placebo effect. And another thing about me is that I'm a solution finder. I'm a problem solver. So you normally get anxious, not for this irrational reason, which is very rational, but um, you normally get anxious because something's going wrong. You're scared something will happen. So how do you tackle the situation? How do you get ahead of it? Tell me something that makes you anxious. Me? Yeah. Um, okay, and whatever it is. Yeah. How do we get ahead of the problem? What do we do where it's no longer in our hands and we just have to leave it? Or what do we do to solve it? Like, how do we fix? So that's, I'm not going to sit and be anxious with you about your problem. I'm not going to be, uh, so when someone comes in and going crazy, I'm like, no, let's solve the problem. Let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. Let's figure out the one, two, three. Let's jot it down. And then let's crack the code and get this done with. That's how you solve runs. You can't go for days with it. That's not. Now, at least to me, I know people have anxiety issues and they take medication for it and I respect that and you do you and what's best for you. But to me, solve the problem at hand. So clearly now, in, in case of any crisis, people know who to call. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm not available. This is not something I, you can scot me up for. But yes, if we know each other and we're that close, sure, I will cut out some time for my busy schedule. But yeah. What's the best way to reach you or to grab your attention? It is not that hard. No? It is not that hard to grab my attention. It did not take you that much effort to get me on this couch. It is not that hard. I am glued to my phone. And I will reply to you on WhatsApp before you even sent the message to me. So if I see you typing, I'm already, hey babe, what are you typing? What's going on? Hey, I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm very available to the people I'm available for. It's not hard. That's and I'm, a, I'm, I'm an arrival. I will arrive. You need me, I'm there. For whatever reason. Book club, I don't know, give me reasons to be there. I was at someone's book club recently, it's on my mind, but like Sunday mass, a dinner, a lunch, a pa I'm there. I'm an arrival, I'll arrive. And I'll arrive very overdressed, but I'll arrive. <laughs> Let's talk about you being overdressed. So clearly, right, you hailed for your fashion. First of all, do you style yourself? It's such a funny question. I do not style myself, and nor do I have a stylist. I have 
a boy at home who manages my closet and he has become my stylist so he has organized my clothes the way he sees fit he throws the clothes that he thinks he needs to throw well he doesn't throw it it goes into a suitcase in storage never to be seen again but he has access to the pictures of what's in what and he will not let me leave the house if he has not approved the outfit so yesterday I had four different events where I was going to change not in the house one by one. So he has packed four different bags based on the dress code of the events and has swapped out the things I wanted for the things he wanted. And it's worked very well. So I'm not going to say he's doing a bad job. He's doing a great job <laughs> to the extent that I wore rings all day last weekend. So yesterday when I put on the same rings, he's like, Baba, no, you have to wear these rings in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Taken it out and put it in the dedicated Ziploc for those rings that have been worn this whole weekend and have now been photographed and has pushed it to the back of the drawer. So he's really at it. And yeah, that's it. He knows t-shirt from t-shirt and pant from pant and shoe from shoe. And yeah. That's Look at you, you have a fashion whisperer at your home. A what? A fashion whisperer. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I will not wear it out if he doesn't say it looks cool. I just want. I'd say, yeah, take the care, then he'll say, yeah, take the care. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that's the line. Then when he says, then only I'll go. So if I'm leaving the house even at 12.30 in the morning and he, he doesn't care, like he cares, but he, he's not going to waste his time to like help me. So if he wants to go at 11 and I'm still getting ready, he'll wait. I'm making him wait. I was like, I don't want to stop. I mean, I haven't even been ready yet. And only after his approval will I leave the house. Which you big on fashion. Do you, do you love fashion? I mean, it's a good pastime, it's a good hobby, but passion is also a way to make anything fun. If you go anywhere and you're dressed well, now I'm going to get destroyed for saying that because I'm in the most basic outfit after this shoot. And everyone's going to look at what he's wearing while he's talking about dressing. You slain. And that I think to be when I was like, I'm working on myself, I go to the gym. The comment section, he doesn't look like a boy who goes to the gym. He doesn't look, his body fat percentage is really hard. He ain't going to the gym twice a day. I was obviously like 15 kilos heavier back then. But um, yes, fashion is a way to fantasize your life. Like you make yourself into a little magic and a little story and a little narrative is going on and you made yourself into this, into a character. That's the only way to do it. So you're going for a boring lunch, but you're dressed cool. You made that lunch interesting because you look cool. And to me, that's what it is. Fashion is creating a fantasy. It's telling a story. It's creating the narrative. You have met some of the most unimaginable people for most of us out there, right? You've met Kylie Jenner, you've met Love Kanye West, you've Love met Joe Jonas, Paris Hilton. How does it happen? You know what? The criteria for being in a picture with me is being next to me for 10 seconds. Okay. That's all it takes. If you're next to me for 10 seconds, I got that picture, you got the picture, that's it. You want a picture with me? 10 seconds. I want a picture with you? 10 seconds. I just need 10 seconds before... You are and I are comfortable with each other enough for me to say, can we take a, let, let's, let's not even can we take a picture. Shall we get photographed together? Um, that being said, I met all four of the people that you mentioned for way more than 10 seconds. Um, I've actually met Kylie Jenner twice. Okay. I met her once as a fan where I stood in a line at a restaurant to take a selfie with her as a cute little fan. I was the only one. She actually took one with maybe like four people total and it was me. And I know that when she you was when you put something out into the universe, it comes back to you. And she came back to me and I met her at her own house in LA. That's a very funny story, very interesting story, but you can't ask me it, so I won't tell. Oh my um, God. Kanye, we happened to be at a fashion show together and he liked my look, which I didn't understand. It was the most basic thing in the world. I looked like a pumpkin. And then his assistant or someone from his team sent me an invite for his fashion show, which was the week later. And so I met him again and then he went wild after that and whatever and Joe Jonas actually just he was sitting behind me at a restaurant I was like 16 years old and I just went up to him and I was like can I have a photo and he was like of course and then I actually like you know overstayed my welcome and sat down on the table with him and never got up and I think I said the most dumbest things because I was so nervous and I asked him something and he was like oh google it and I was like what's google because I was like so <laughs> like you know I was like so confused as to how like but that was like I was a little kid not a little kid, but I was like, whatever, a little older. But um, who is the other one you asked? Oh, uh, Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton, she's a gem. I met her like twice or thrice. I, she's just a really, really nice, friendly person. I can't say we're friends, we're not friends. But I met her 
she's a, she's been, she helped me the last time. And then he, and you also spoke about having like elevator pitch, right? Because meeting Hollywood celebrities is a little different than meeting Bollywood celebrities. I know, so I didn't think about it. No, she did that. I think I picked it up somewhere. Was it Reddit? Was it uh, your Cosmo interview? Could have been. What did I say? So basically, you were telling me. right now. That's okay. So basically, you were talking about how sometimes, you know, you, you, you said that basically there's an, you have a 30 oh, second course. window. Yes. And a 30 second when you sort of make someone second. you don't know it. Of course, with a Hollywood celebrity, see in Bombay, we all know each other more or less, or eventually will, or may know who's who, because it's a small city. But of course, when you meet a Hollywood, or when you meet anyone you don't know, that you want to get along with, the agenda's on you, not on them. Because when you're meeting Anne Hathaway, she doesn't care to meet you. She's being polite and she's being nice, but she doesn't care to meet you. But that's not just Anne Hathaway. It could be anyone who may not know you. In the social climbing world of things, you want to meet her, right? You want to be her friend. So what is your elevator pitch? To make sure you strike a chord with her that she'll remember you. And I guarantee you she'll remember me as that sweet little Indian boy that she met in Rome who was shivering. Because I, I did I did shiver, I'm not going to lie. She It was Anne Hathaway and she was looking amazing. Sure, we spoke for like 20 to 30 minutes. But like, she'll remember that I was so cute. It was a fake shiver, but it was a shiver nonetheless. Okay, so have you ever been starstruck? It's so funny that you ask and who hasn't. But um, it's funny because... The person I was once starstruck by is actually a very close friend of mine now. A very good friend, friends like family type friends. And um, it's a story that dates many years ago, like maybe over seven or eight. Okay. Or many. And I was in New York studying and I did not know Janvi Kapoor at the time and we hadn't ever met. But she was Janvi Kapoor. And there was a murmur going around New York City that Janvi Kapoor was coming to town. And the vibe was like, you better not shout, you better not cry, you better not do it. I'm telling you why. John V. Kapoor was coming to town and she was. And I knew because a really good friend of hers was a really good friend of mine. And that mutual friend was like, hey, Ori, John V's coming to town. And, you know, I lived in New York. You live here, you should take us out or should we come over for dinner? I was like, yes, of course you should. You should come. Like, John V. Kapoor's going, my house? You live by? Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I was waiting for the day. I was waiting for the moment. And all week, all of Manhattan, every Indian was talking about how John V. Kapoor was coming to town. Whether they were saying good things or bad things, I had to keep my mouth shut because I couldn't be the leak of the information. Not, not if I had to meet her. Like, I didn't want to look like the spreader of you know, the news. And so I'd be at dinner with people and they'd be murmuring about it to like, <laughs> keep the secret. Like, I couldn't say what she's coming to town. I couldn't say it. Um, no one was supposed to know for sure, but everyone was talking about it. All the girls were talking about it. All the boys were talking about it. The parents of the kids in India were talking about it, you know. And, but I didn't know the date that she was coming at my house. So that whole week, I knew that, you know, it's possible today. It's po you have to wishful thinking, you know. And, uh, and I was at a friend's birthday at a nightclub in New York called Up and Down. Really, all our friends, that was the only place we used to go for, but really cool club. And I think it was like snowy time or it was cold or whatever, rainy time or whatever it was that I was there. And then my friend messaged me saying, here's a rookie free come now. I was like, it's like the moment I've been waiting for, my moment of golden ticket, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, <laughs> I'm coming. And I was like, okay, like now, now? And um, they were like, yeah, yeah, we're coming now. Like we'll just leave the hotel and whatever. Like we show up, I had to run, I had to leave. So birthday, cool. Been here, done that. I've been for this party before. I've been for this party 10 times in the past and I'll go again. And you know, I'm really short. So inside my sneakers, I put like lifts, like little inches. So I've exited the club and it was like snowing and raining or sludgy or something was wrong with the weather. And the, I didn't have time to think about the freaking weather. Chandi Kapoor was coming to my house. And um, I got out and I couldn't get an Uber and I couldn't get a taxi and the club is here and my house is here and, and I was just like, what's going on? I was like, and I got out of the club, I like, you know there's memes where it's like, like someone messaging me, my parents aren't told come run, like run home, because she was coming and, and did she come? She just came in her perfectness and her glamour and her aura and her auras entered, come on the street, 23rd street and her aura's gone up my elevator and it's, rang the bell and she was everything that she was meant to be. She was, and I couldn't tell anyone why I left the club. I couldn't tell them that I was going to meet John B. Kapoor because no one was meant to know and they wouldn't have been happy about it. They would have, they would have all put Nazar on 
they would have all evil eyed me and made sure that I didn't meet Johnny Kapoor that day. And I met her. And she served everything that was, I don't even know what she served, but whatever I expected, she lived up to each expectation. <laughs> she is the celebrity that you are not. She is the celebrity that I am not. And she was a celebrity that neither of us are back then. Yeah. Is she as fun as advertised? She's as fun. She's uh, more fun, prettier, nicer, cooler, smart, all the compliments. Yeah. I'm a fan. I was a fan then, I'm a fan today. I'm a fan and a friend, definitely. That's fans and family, fans and friends and fans. Fans and family. So, yeah. Now that you're so famous, what does fame mean to you? I wouldn't say I'm famous. Oh, come on. Popular, yes. Very Incredible. popular, surely. Um, almost famous. Like, almost famous. Again, I'm on that fence between millennial and Gen Z fame is almost famous. What does fame mean to me? Fame is attention. I think fame and attention hurts no one. At least I hope it doesn't. And attention is a form of love. And who doesn't want to be loved? So does it excite you? Does of it course, tempt does you? It not, who does it not excite? I mean, I'm sure there's some people who say, oh, anxiety, I don't want the attention. No, 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 I want it. You don't want the attention? Give it to me. I'll take it. I'm not even complaining. <laughs> so would you choose a life where you get to do everything that you love? Okay, you get to travel. Mm -hmm. You get to have these adventurous stories. You get to have the best of friends mm -hmm. without being famous. Mm -hmm. Or would you choose a life where you would be famous, but you wouldn't have the access to doing a lot of this that you enjoy? Such a interesting question. If you're famous but not enjoying things, then what's the point of being famous, right? I'm famous on a life or death thing for me. It's not make it or break it. Like, like, would you like to give me a nice watch? Sure. It's not going to like kill me or make me. The fame's not going to kill me or make me. Is it fun? Of course it's fun. Is it entertaining? Of course it's entertaining. But it's not going to make or break me. Now, I had a life where I wasn't famous and I loved my life. I absolutely love my life then and I love it today and I hope I love it tomorrow too. But, you know, um, it's not a make it or break it. I'm living my best life. I, I'm, you go for a jog, you're a jogger. You paint, you're a painter. I'm living, I'm a liver. I am here to live. I'm living. Yeah, I'm a liver. Sometimes I say to people, I'm, I'm a liver. They're like, okay, I'm a pair of lungs. I'm like, no, babe. Like, I'm a liver. I am living. I'm here to live. And let live, but live first. Very interesting. Thank you. So, how has life really changed for you pre and post? Pre and post what? Pre and post this fame, pre and post uh, Viral Bihani actually, you know, put his premium on you. Love him, hmm. thank him and respect him for doing the things he does. It wasn't an overnight thing, it was a gradual process. So, like you get used to something, it's, I don't know how to explain it, like I had a hair transplant, now how did life change for me? No, the hair grew slowly, slowly and a graduate, I can't say, oh, it changed like this. I can't say more people want to talk to me. I can't say get more attention for things. I can't say I'm sitting on this couch only because of that. I can say like when I'm at a, a party, I'm out in public, people have recorded me walking from A to Z and I absolutely love it. And I can say people will come and take selfies with me and I do love it. Do you ever think about life and death? Yeah, every day. I don't drive anymore because when I would drive my car, I would just think about dying. Like if I drove my car, the only thought that would be in my head is, what if this man walks in front of me and I kill him? And then I get so panicked that I crash the car and I die and five more people die too. Or what if I just bang into a wall? Or, you know, what if when I'm opening the car do I walk on a car so I don't drive anymore? I can't do it. When I'm writing the open letters that I said I write to my friends on their birthdays, my biggest fear in writing the letters while I'm writing, well, and the pen just goes out my nose and into my brain and I die right there. Will I even know I died or will it be like in pain for a bit? And the, you know, like... Like I said, when my friend left me at that party last weekend, it wasn't that she left me at the party because she thought I was having a friend. She was, I was like, I was like, babe, this is attempted murder. I could have fallen off the terrace. I could have drowned in the pool. Like, death is so close and yet so far. Okay, that's good. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think about it a lot more. No, maybe the same amount as everyone. I'm sure everyone thinks the same thoughts. But where does this car crash bit come from? Because I, I think that you, while talking about your fears also, like. Was, was there an incident that happened? So, a while ago, there were like five car crash stories in the same week. Someone on the Pune Expressway, someone on the ceiling going to a car. There were like so many and I was like, this is not for me. I ain't driving no car. And I gave it up. I have an Indian license, I have a British license, I have an American license. I can drive. I ain't driving. Okay. And what's that one thing that you will never give up? My faith. Yeah? Yeah. I will never give up my faith. He who believes conquers, and I will never give up my faith. No, never. And you have conquered a lot of hearts by this podcast. Thank you so much, Ari. I thought it was an interview. 